Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Flow Show. I don't know what day it is today. That's how behind I am this morning. It is, what is it? First of October, pinch punch, first of the month. Got you all no returns. Welcome, everybody. And I've got a couple of special guests today. A certain Mr. Michael Brown, who you know well before, and one of my namesakes, or our namesakes, Mr. Ryan Paisy from Peak Suite. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you doing? Good morning, good morning, good morning. Now I finally worked out how to use my Zoom. <laughs> is it really the first? It? it is the first of October, isn't it? Oh, yep. God. It's October. How many sleeps mention, until Christmas? I was just going to say, don't mention Christmas because I've already had that. Uh, I've already pulled Michael's plums about that on the, the trade off. <laughs> <laughs> good so morning, all. Yes, yeah. it's far too early to be talking about Christmas. <laughs> it is indeed. Um, right, so I'm going to get those these two guys' involvement in the show as we go through, uh, do what I usual, talk about the headlines and whatnot, and get through a few bits and pieces. Firstly, just to reiterate, or just to let you know, we've extended our sale by a couple of days. The, 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 I'll tell you what, the team always do the same thing. They always do a sale up to the end of the month and don't take into account that people get paid across the end of the month. Um, so we've extended that a couple of days now, as you can see on the screen there. So last chance to take advantage of that for another couple of days at least. Right, moving on, let's get into what's going on in markets. Um, it might be a surprise, China stocks didn't go up today. That's because they're closed. <laughs> so uh, nothing happening there. We might. Yeah, I don't believe you. Sorry, I don't. Surely, surely, <laughs> surely they must have gone up again. Surely. <laughs> well, I had to do a second take. I looked at it. I thought, oh, they're up <laughs> another eight percent again today. Then I thought, oh no, they're shut. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, uh, so nothing there. But they'll probably continue tomorrow when they open. They'll have to make up for today. Yeah, exactly. Tomorrow. Um, China and U.S. commerce ministers are going to hold a call in the near future, uh, part of this stepping up from China in their communications with uh, some Western countries, trying to ease tensions there. A lot more to be done on that. Um, over in Japan, it won't surprise you to know that they didn't intervene while dollar yen and yen pairs were dropping through the floor uh, in the period 29th of August to September 26th. So zero intervention from those. Uh, we had the BOJ September minutes out, um, as we can expect uh, hearing from the various members since. Uh, we've had members talking about the uncertainty over the US economy and the pace of Fed cuts. Um, they say some said they must be mindful of a chance. It may have a negative effect on Japan's FX and corporate profits. Uh, one member said additional rate hike now is not desirable. So the doves and the hawks. Still battling it out over there. Um, we've had uh, Ishiba's new cabinet taking shape. Uh, they've got, I don't know if this is a new post, but uh, apparently this is the Economic Revitalization Minister, Akazawa, uh, saying he wants the BOJ to decide on future rate hikes carefully. Uh, new this that sorry this sounds like a made up post that someone needs a job right <laughs> this, this, this sounds like right we need to get him out out of one office but into another one because he's got he's got some dirt on us <laughs> <laughs> i tell you what they, they do love a, a long title over there um <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised they stick it just finance minister instead of the minister of financial affairs and uh counting <laughs> the beans I'm funny but, uh, there we go um, so the new finance minister, uh, Katsunobu Kato, said that Ishiba has asked for a push towards wage hikes. Um, now, from the comments I've read this morning, um, it seems that uh, it's been out with the old, um, in with the old, in terms of what they want to achieve with the economy. Though some of these ministers and uh, Ishiba himself has taken just a slightly more cautious approach regarding rate hikes. They're all for the BOJ continuing. Um, but I'm just picking up the sentiment they are a bit more cautious about it. So that has had a little bit of effect in part on some yen pairs at some points. But otherwise, the BOJ are free to do what they want to do. Um, jumping into a bit of data, PMI Day. Um, that kicked off uh, in Asia with uh, Australia coming in as expected, 46.7, but that was down on last month, so still well into contraction. A um, bit of data out from Japan, as you can see there as well. Unemployment rate 
coming down to 2.5%, all well and good there. Uh, we've got all this tank and survey data coming out as well, which is a little bit mixed, some up, some down, some all over the place. Um, their manufacturing PMI as well was out, and uh, we beat expectations, but it did drop from last month. So uh, we're still seeing a lot of these, some of these hovering around that 50 mark, but mostly all in contraction. Um, that continued over into Europe. Uh, Spain, still the poster boy for Europe at the moment, 53 on their manufacturing PMI. That's why they've been raising their growth forecasts in the face of the Germans doing the opposite. Um, I know Ryan's got uh, more than a few <laughs> comments to be said about Germany and their uh, economic No comment, no comment. <laughs> what, what did you make of the fact that they scrapped any um, – GDP targets uh, forecast for the rest of the to year. To be honest, I think I'm I think I'm surprised it took uh, it took them this long. I think it was I think what did we have before they decided to scrap them? Um, did we have three downgrades on the spin? I believe it was um, chunky yeah, as well. I think it's yeah. I think it's just more of a case of like, look, guys, we can't keep we can't keep making this publicly available that uh, we have no faith. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, better to say nothing than something bad, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Very much so. Um, some of the other numbers, France or Italy, they saw a move backwards as well, 48.3. France improved over the flash number by six pips uh, and an increase over last month. Uh, Germany even managed to improve on their flash number, but still couldn't turn around the loss from last month. Uh, Pan Eurozone number, obviously reflecting the mix of those numbers. And the UK flash number um, was unchanged, 51.5, a point down on last month. Um, we've got this Eurozone inflation data as well, which came in as expected. This number here, this 1.8 expected, got revised down from 1.9 yesterday after that German data. Um, so that has come in as expected. Lagarde touted um, that yesterday. Um, she's also pretty much nailed on what we think is pretty much nailed on. I know Michael shares his view that uh, they're going to cut... In October, she said the latest developments strengthen our confidence that inflation will return to target in a timely manner. And we will take that into, a, in a, into account in our next monetary policy meeting in October. Uh, domestic inflation is only easing very gradually. So it was a little bit of a counter. Um, we talked about this uh, on the trade off yesterday, mate. Seems like a done deal, doesn't it, October now? Uh, yes, absolutely. I'd be very surprised they didn't go in October. And, and actually, I think the, the debate with the ECB now is is more a case of what comes after October, um, because it's obviously going to be back to back 25 bit cuts, September and October, pretty much nailed on again that they go in December as well. So are we now talking about a situation where actually the sort of easiest option for the ECB is just to go 25 basis points every meeting until they get back to neutral, which is probably sort of two ish percent early next summer. I think that's probably the, the base case at the moment, um, which obviously is is roughly in line with the pace you'd expect to see uh, from the FOMC, but still a, a fair chunk quicker than we're likely to get elsewhere in G10. You know, you think you get about the BOE, very reluctant to deliver cuts, the RBA, the Norges Bank haven't delivered any cuts at all yet. So I think um, some risks, uh, some downside risks, certainly to the euro in, in the crosses at the moment. Yeah, very much so. And uh, just to do a little pump, I'm going to put uh, in the chat function here in Zoom. Um, if you want to have uh, a look at our trade-off show that we do every week, that I do every week with uh, Mr. Brown there, you can do so. Obviously, don't watch it while you're in the middle of the flow show. Or I don't think that's it. <laughs> um, but uh, bookmark that for afterwards. Uh, we um, do this every week. Yeah, go on, mate. One on this then. So obviously, as we all know, yeah, so I think as Michael and yourself have said, um, done deal, 25 basis uh, pips. Uh, base points this, this time coming. So was it 17th of October? Um, I'm guessing we're all in agreement that Germany is like, if Germany had their way, we'd be cutting 50, right? Yeah, probably. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this is right. When you look at the US cutting 50, you're like, well, hang on a second. The Germans must be sitting there thinking, come on, please, please, please. Um, well, I, think... I mean, actually, that's a that's a good question. You know, what I think it's a high bar that the ECB go 50, but I wouldn't say it's completely impossible. Not necessarily, uh, well, certainly this, not in October, but not before it, right? the end of the year. I mean, as you say, the, the economy is spluttering at best. We're at 1.8% headline CPI. What's the chances we 
undershoot that 2% target significantly. I mean, you know, it, it's a decent well, yeah, prospect, so this is, this I would say, and markets where, aren't pricing it at all. This is kind of where I was trying to get to, right? So when we take a step back and we look at, you know, yeah, I don't think any of us, myself and Michael, what we'd spoke back before, um, so Ryan, I'm assuming you're in the same boat, that none of us expected a 50 basis point cut from the FOMC. Um, and if you look at the data and you look at kind of the, the general vibe of the economy, obviously it's all about the vibes. Um, but if you look at that there and you compare the US situation and data to the European situation and data, especially when you look at the powerhouse of the Europe, well, what was the powerhouse of the EU and the, and the ECB being Germany, they're in a far worse place. So you, there is an argument to be made. Well, if the US, if the FOMC cut 50, these should be ECB should definitely be cutting 50. Now, I don't think they will do because there's been no, they've not hinted at all that they would. But then again, I didn't think that the, um, the US would do it. So again, like Michael said, it's not something that I'm expecting, but I believe it's one of those things that we've got to, have it on the radar in case it is a surprise because that you know it's been one of those years right where everything's been a surprise yeah, yeah i think the <laughs> one thing that one big difference between obviously the ecb and the fomc is the, the fed are trying to balance both sides of the dual mandate so even though inflation is still you know considerably above um expectations uh, or above the, the target i should say you know they are now uh, unemployment rising is somewhat threatening their maximum employment goal so they're now trying to balance both sides of that of course the ecb officially at least only have to focus on getting to two percent inflation so perhaps those downside growth risks carry a little bit less weight among members of the governing council, particularly when you've got this really odd situation where actually a lot of the southern European states are actually going, well, why the hell are you going to deliver rate cuts? We're going along it absolutely fine as it is. Yeah. Oh, mate, but yeah. on that, if you if you're if, you know, if you're sitting in Greece at the moment and you're a politician and you remember how badly the Germans were treating you back in the day, you must be rubbing your hands together right now. Yeah, that's what <laughs> happened with uh, Spain last week, wasn't it? Every time um, that Germany put out a bit of bad data, Spain had <laughs> a growth forecast. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly that. Exactly that. Yeah, you, you know, you've got, respect, you got respect, you know, game respects game. Exactly, exactly. But, you know, to, just to play the other side of the coin, um, you know, on the face of it, yes, if you look, you know, side by side, then the, the Eurozone economy deserves a bigger cut than, than the US, but the US has their rates far higher than the ECB yeah. had. Yeah, there is that. Um, so there's room to, to go on that. And, you know, like you say, these southern states, they're not doing all that badly, you know, and, and the Eurozone is a is a collection of countries, not just Germany. Um, I, much I do Germany. remember, it must have, oh God, um, my memory is shock, shocking. I can't even remember if I had breakfast this morning, but I do remember, <laughs> I believe it was a couple of weeks ago or a few weeks ago, when if anyone remembers, again, you know, back in the Euro crisis, Germany were basically telling, German politicians were telling Greek politicians, look, start selling some of your islands uh, yep. to, pay, to pay back debt. And there was a uh, was a comment or a statement issued um, by one of the Greek um, politicians in, in recent weeks. And basically he turned around to Germany and said, well, hang on a second. You have got a few islands in the North Sea you could start shipping off if you wanted to. Which I'm like, <laughs> there's nothing about, you know, revenge or whatever it is being served cold. And this was freezing, but well worth it. <laughs> yeah, definitely worth can it. I, um, can I throw a potential I thought you were going to say throw a bid in for a second for an island. Yeah. <laughs> well, we could, we could... paid you far too much money, mate. <laughs> we could have a whip round. Um, the potential spanner in the works, the balance oh. sheet. No one seems to be talking about this. Um, central banks across G10 continuing to run down their balance sheets. The BOE, obviously, um, in September, reaffirming that they're going to go 100 billion quid worth of gilts off the balance sheet over the next 12 months. At what point do central banks have to bring quantitative tightening to an end because the two primary policy levers are effectively working against each other? You're trying to ease and remove restriction by delivering rate cuts, but at the same time, you're letting a shed load of gilts or EGBs or treasuries or whatever it is roll off the balance sheet, which you would argue is is somewhat limiting the effect of, of those rate cuts. I would say, is it limiting the effects? You, you know, a lot of people are saying it may limit the effects, but is it at the moment? I mean, look at the financial conditions index in the, the US. 
for this. Is it's only an hour long, mate. We haven't got enough time to get into that. <laughs> is, it, is it City that, that run that or something? And it's coming down even while this still doing uh, rolling off the balance sheet. I think the, the important factor is they need to get their balance sheet down purely to give them enough room for when the shit hits the fan next time. Um, this is it, right? Is that a whole you know, is that whole tight? Is that whole tight and when you can, you know, relax when you must. So it's like you know, you basically they're, they're just kind of trying to get more dry, well, re-dry some wet powder, right? So they can throw at it again when they need to. You know, because this yeah. is the way. Well, yeah, everyone's just the king of can kicking at the moment. Try saying that three times fast, Jesus. Yeah, I've got some, <laughs> some pictures. I've got some old pictures of that Draghi kicking cans and whatnot. But anyway, <laughs> I digress. Let's let's crack on and get through the rest of it, and then uh, we can have a good old chin make about it after. Um, we've had ECB's Ren also tipping his hat to October, saying based on cooling inflation, there's more reasons for cutting rates in October. Um, over at the Fed, Bostic is open to another 50 pip cut if the labour market shows unexpected weakness. Uh, it doesn't want to get overconfident on inflation, given core PCE price index remains at 2.7%. Uh, he's going to be watching the upcoming jobs data closely. He says if employment growth slows much below 100,000 jobs, it would warrant closer questioning of what is happening. Uh, he says his business contacts continue to say they do not expect layoffs. So we're still in the low hiring, not firing phase at the moment. The ever excitable Fed Goolsby is now uh, shitting a brick about uh, this potential port shutdown in the US and its effects on the economy. This guy is always, he's always to the extreme panicking about something. Uh, Fed's Powell was out yesterday and uh, he's giving the uh, 50 pippers a uh, kicking the nuts he said if the economy evolves broadly as expected policy will move over time towards a more neutral stance we are not on any preset course the risks are two-sided and we will continue to make our decisions meeting by meeting then he got stuck into the dove saying the fed is not in a hurry to cut rates quickly there's still two employment reports and an inflation report to come before the november meeting says there's no data yet that influences decisions for the November meeting. If the economy evolves as expected, it would mean two more cuts this year for a total of 50 basis points. Now, as you'll know, we keep an eye on uh, the expectations. Just looking at the CME Fed watch, we've had another switch around. We were trading or pricing 58 plus percent for a 50 last week. We're now gone the other way. It's now 63% for a 25. Um, he's done his usual suck the volatility out of the next meeting, hasn't he, guys? Well, I was just going to say that what Powell has done there is at, say absolutely nothing new. He's just taken the dot plot that was sent out about 10 days ago and put it into words because the median of that dot plot had 100 basis points total okay. easing this year. They've delivered 50. There's 50 left to go. Um, I really struggle to see why markets certainly market participants and financial media are getting particularly excited about this because to me it doesn't really seem like powell's told us anything new i think the fed's reaction function is is pretty clear they went big in september probably in part to get ahead of any potential labor market weakness in part because they may have regretted not going in july and in part because the market bullied them into it they're going to go at 25 basis points per meeting from here onwards, unless labour data softens, primarily unemployment north of 4.4%, as we were discussing yesterday, uh, Ryan. And um, if it doesn't, they go at 25. If it does, then they might chuck another 50 in the mix. And I don't really think Powell said anything particularly surprising yesterday, unless I'm completely missing something. Well, no, you're, uh, you're right. But is this a, this is the usual case. Is he's sitting there watching markets, watching expectations, and the market getting all doved up over a 50 again, and him deciding he needs but to this is it, right? say the same thing just to calm it down a bit. So, but this is it, right? I, sorry, I do think it's a bit rich from him to be coming out with this. So basically mugging off people over getting getting uh, frothy knickers over a 50 basis point cut when it was him that did the 50 basis point cut yeah you can't like you know what what's he what's he trying to say that it was a hawkish 50 cut like you know it's like i just no, I, think, I, I get what michael i get what mr brown my dear friend mr brown is saying but at the same time i think you know it, you know you can't cut 50 like when all right so towards the, the latter days it was kind of price getting more and more increasingly priced in but no one on the street was really thinking they were going to cut 50 um and then 
when you do cut 50, everyone gets all dovish and then you mug them off for being dovish. It's like, mate, yep. pick a side. I do think it also, yeah, I, I really hate having, you know, tinfoil is not my colour, right? So I'm not going to be making a, you know, making a habit of dressing up in tinfoil with my tinfoil fedora, but the cut 50 just reeked of some kind of political kind of nonsense as much as anything else. Um, and this whole, oh, they're doing it because they didn't, they didn't, they didn't cut in July. They're trying to get in front of it. I don't know. I think it's far simpler than they were just, you know, they knew that they were going to spook the market one way or the other because there was going to, you know, just the way it was priced, there was going to be a lot of repositioning, whatever the, the, the number. And, you know, when they looked at the, the OIS pricing um, and they just kind of went, do you know what? There's less repricing that happens if we cut 50 plus it's, you know, it's not, um, it's not a bad thing to do politically, but yeah, that's just my two cents on it. But I think he's, yeah, I get what Michael's saying. He's not said anything new here, but at the same time, he didn't need to say anything. And I just think it's a bit rich kind of mugging off dubs after you've just cut 50 basis points kind of out of the blue. Anyway. No, I, I agree with that. And I mean, I said it right at the time when I did the 50, he's opened up a can of worms with this one because then the market's going to want more 50s. Massively. It's like <clears> and, we, you know, the market does smell blood, right? Well, the yeah. market can smell blood and it definitely did previously. The market is, is is a bit like a child. You know, you tell a child, don't touch the oven, it's hot. They still want to go and touch the oven. Um, and it's the same with, with these rate cuts. The market, every time we get a bad piece of data, we price 50s. Then power looks at it and goes, all right, well, I need to say a little something just to steer them back the other way. It's like, it. like herding exactly. cats. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, anyway, that was power done for. Um, the only other bit of news is just on this Israel Lebanon stuff that uh, the IDF have announced that they were going to start a ground, uh, a limited ground operation in southern Lebanon. So that stuff still uh, kicking off and rolling by, but we're not seeing too much effect on risk assets. Um, so that's uh, pretty much all I've got on the headline front. I don't know if there's any items you gents have uh, that have popped up on your radar this morning. Mr. Brown, would you like to go first if you've got anything? Uh, no. Because I think we've covered absolutely <laughs> everything, to be honest. Good. Um, well, <laughs> I was going to flag about um, this, obviously, the port strikes. Obviously, everyone on X and social media is now an expert in ports. Um, there's obviously only a few. There's a couple of people that I would actually worth, uh, work, sorry, which are worth following, um, which I've tweeted on my account a few times this morning. What I'm going to try and do later on today, if I get times, could put together a little list of the people that I actually think are worth following regarding this port story. Um, because obviously if it does drag on, um, it's going to have some serious impacts. Um, you know, it's based for those that don't know, it's pretty much all of the East coast and the Gulf coast containerized ports, um, which obviously is just all export, import, export of all the goods that the U S needs. Um, I think it's like 60% of exports are currently affected or imports are currently affected. Um, one interesting thing I found was. Oh, never so, in, so interesting that he's disappeared. Yeah, we lost uh, you for a minute, mate. Oh, <laughs> Hello? Am I, right, yeah, uh, yeah. How do I post into... Uh, if I Can you hear me yet? Can I post yeah, yeah. I just something to you? But I might have posted you right directly. So if you can whack that in the, the normal chat. Um, yeah. Basically, just, it's, uh, just, just where you post, it should yeah. say who you're posting to. If it says hosts and panellists, oh, just click well, on it and change it to everyone. So I've I'll not got the options. There, that. I've only got hosts and panellists. Uh, okay, well, I've done it. But anyway, so anyway, it's up there. So basically, it's an interesting map. Well, I think it's interesting. Not low bar for me because I'm a bit of a nerd. Um, but it's showing all the inland ports that you wouldn't really expect to be impacted by this. But it's basically, you know, a, the corn belt really are being absolutely smashed by, well, potentially could be smashed by this because obviously it doesn't help that we're just at the tail end of um, harvest season. So there's a lot of grain out there that would normally make its way to the Gulf Coast ports and potentially some of the East Coast ports, um, that currently now is stuck. So there is some, you know, it's not just containers we've got to think of, or, you know, it's very easy for us to think about uh, based on what COVID, uh, happened over COVID, which is, oh, it's just imports from China that are impacted. It's definitely not the case with this. Uh, we could be seeing some significant exports from the US being impacted, which is especially commodities and uh, grains and such. Um, so, yeah, this is definitely something to keep an eye on. And again, I'm no marine biologist. I'm no expert on any of this. But from the smarter people in the room that I listen to, they make uh, quite strong assertion that 
you know, if the strike lasts a week, it takes far longer than a week for all of this to be unwound because there's a huge backlogs that develop because everything's obviously just in time and all that stuff. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, it's nice to see media picking up on this today. But, you know, where it's kind of one of those where were you last two, three weeks? Um, myself and Mr. Brown have been speaking about this quite a lot on our little morning blast show. It's just, you know, also, you know, it's the, the uh, elephant in the room is that this is quite well, has the potential to be quite a significant driver of inflation if this does turn into a prolonged action um again which obviously feeds through into monetary policy so i think there's a lot at stake here and i think over the next couple of days um uh, yeah as uh, patrick says this is on top of all the storm damage i think it's like 1.6 million homes still without power so yeah. yeah there's a lot going on in the us right now and you know well, okay all three of us are based in the uk so maybe it's getting more attention in the us but from what i'm seeing on social media um and in western kind of business press and stuff it seems to be very underreported so i think this is something for the european lads to uh, try and make sure they keep an active eye on yeah no we, we were very much on top of that as well back in i think it, it first reared its head back in the beginning of september yeah um, yeah that's exactly well this is it these 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 contracts have been like the six i think they're like a six-year contract so we've known about it for some quite some time i think it was raymondo yesterday there was an interview and someone um asked her um what what's like like what, what's the what's your expectations if this if these strikes go on for longer than a couple of weeks and she said something ridiculous like oh i haven't really been focused on that it's like that more than half of your like import exports could are potentially like that, right <laughs> and you're going to turn around and you're the you know you're the head of commerce for the country and you've just gone oh i haven't really been looking at that yeah, there's there's an argument to be made that she's basically been just focused on rewriting the CV, but that's not for me to say. <laughs> <laughs> Are you saying there's uh, inept politicians around, mate? <laughs> oh, but perhaps, mate, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, well, let's not go down there, otherwise we'll be about two hours on that uh, on that subject. Um, right, before we go looking at prices, what I did want to do is just highlight for you guys, and I believe his nibs has got a. Uh, a good offer for you if you don't know about ryan and his peak suite uh, it's a great platform uh, of news aggregation lots of analysis aggregation as well we're on there of course i'm going to put the link to you there um, if you want to check that out and <clears throat> just to show you i know i've showed uh, my viewers here the peak suite already but uh, here's awesome. another look at it it's uh, completely customizable so you can put stuff in, pull stuff out, move it around, add what you want. There's a whole host of feeds and all the bits and bobs, news feeds, apps, premium apps, education, you name it, and you can just add these, take them away as you see fit to build your own customizable platform. Um, now, you've got a little offer for us, I believe. Yes, I have. Um, I forgot what your code was. A uh, Flow, isn't it? It's Flow. Is that right? No, yes. Forex. I've oh, got Forex. I'm sorry. Yes, I've got sorry. a little for you. I've got so many, I've got so got many promo codes coming up. Yes. Yeah. So basically, just for everyone to also, firstly, Ryan, thank you so much for the little plug there. Um, like like Ryan said, it's 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 our little baby. It's been growing quite fast um, over recent months, uh, and it's it's scheduled to grow a lot faster and a lot better in in the near very near future um as such our prices which have been ridiculously cheap for a long time now it's like 10 pounds a month for the premium tier you know all of this that ryan's got here pretty much most of that is free to access um we're trying to keep it as free as possible because it's my belief that you know it's hard enough to make money out there at the best of times you know if you don't want to be spending stupid amounts of money to um pay for news and stuff that's out there already so we're just trying to make it easier for investors and traders to kind of or, you know aggregate all the information that's out there in a nice safe space um so if you use the code forex that's all uppercase on the desktop checkout there is a mobile site which is all completely free as well but that's very much lightweight just some feeds on there so anyway if you use the forex um promo code you will get a year's free subscription to the high iq tier and not only that but when or if when you do decide to um pay which obviously in 12 months time, you will get uh, locked in at the current rate, which is £10 a month or £60 a year. To give you a guide at the end of this week, potentially next week, whenever the developers give me the thumbs up, the price will be going up to £30 a month and £300 a year. And there is a ton of new features on the roadmap and loads of cool new feeds coming. We're hopefully expanding our partnership with CME as well, which is going to be looking to get more 
data, um, especially with Quick, who put, uh, who uh, powered the FedWatch page. So we're in bed with those guys as well. So lots of cool things coming. One of the cool features we've just got is uh, the custom feed option, which allows you to, at the moment, each, well, up until now, each feed has been like a standalone um, app. Yeah, we do need to change how the grid structure works as well. Um, so make it a bit more intuitive. But yeah, there's a lot going on. Yeah, we we realize there's a lot of glitter that needs this needs to be rolled around in, um, but we're getting there. So that's the main thing. But anyway, that's enough of my plugging. I'm not, I'm pretty much the worst person at self-marketing. So I better shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, good job, mate. Well, good job. That, and, mate. Uh, we're, we're looking forward to doing a lot more with you as well. Exactly uh, that. You know, exactly so, uh, that. Yeah, lots of, lots of plans uh, down the line. So yeah, check that out. It is completely free. You don't have to sign up. You can just go onto the site and, and run it and it's okay. If you want to go a little bit higher up the tier, you just give your email. Uh, you don't need to put in any billing information, obviously. Now you've got that code, you can have 12 months for free and you can't do better than free as far as I'm concerned. I'll tell you um, what, do you, do you want a job on the marketing team? team? Sorry? Do you want a job on the marketing team? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to discuss uh, the commission structure later. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, can't do better than free, as Michael Brown knows when he goes to the bar. So, uh, oh, exactly. Oy, 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 oy. Well, for those that don't know, I have been in the pub with Michael Brown and he walked away without paying. And uh, and he shit brick when the uh, barman ran over to chase him for the money. Which oh, was it, it made my day. I'll give you a clue. <laughs> <laughs> well, funny enough, you and me haven't actually met in person yet. So, we I'm, haven't. I'm That's got to change. Get that. Um, We'll get so, Michael to buy the beers or steal them, whatever he wants to do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm organising a potential shindig 25th of October, mate, Friday. So I know that Friday oh, will suit you because you I'm usually come by that one o'clock anyway. <laughs> no comment, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> right, so anyway, we'll talk about that after. Um, anyway, let's have a look at some market. I've got to look, keep an eye on the clock, make sure we're not uh, running into the face show. Um, right, a little look at what's going on around some of the grounds. Um, we've had some big old moves in the, in the yen pairs at the moment. This one was really sailing high this morning, um, which was a bit of a even a surprise to me. I've been buying it uh, from the mid 143s down to this area here, and I thought the trade was looking a bit uh, like it was heading for the rubbish bin, but it, it turned completely around um, until we got to eight o'clock uh, and almost bang on the number. We saw a bit of a sell-off in yen pairs, uh, a lot of yen pairs, which looks to be maybe some of the uh, first day of the new month, new quarter flows going through, some of the algos and models kicking in at that time, the Mr. 8am man, as we like to call him. And uh, yen pairs have been poleaxed all the way back down again. Um, so it's a bit of a uh, volatility still high. The one-month falls still up above 12%, 12.45%. So they're still running pretty hot. For dollar yen so take that volatility into consideration uh when you're trading this one um for now we did top out just ahead of this 144 and a half area which we've had a bit of action previously over the last few weeks uh so not a shot to see it topping out there um the pullback's taken us back under 144 um this 143 and a half area uh, is one i'm going to be keeping an eye on uh for my positions um 144, probably find a bit of resistance again, 144, 20s, 30s as well. So still a lot of volatility in this one. So take care of that. We've got the PMIs later in the US, ISM as well. Um, so those that hopium trade will be put to the test with those numbers at the very least. Uh, cable, this one, it's it's struggling now. It's really struggling to get through that uh, those high 134s, 134.30s. Uh, if you like, a lot of pairs looking similar at the moment. They're on a bit of a knife edge in terms of what happens now. Um, break down through 133 here, and we're probably going to see a bit of a steeper pullback as a lot of longs up here get washed out. Um, as I say, it's a similar theme that we're seeing in a lot of pairs at the moment. <clears throat> Excuse me, Euro dollar, the same. This is my key area down here, 111 through to call it 1180s. 85. If we get under there, and particularly this 11070 level where we found prior support previously, um, then we again might see a bit of a flush out because all those who've been trying to trade a 112 break um, are probably going to throw in the towel and we see a steeper pullback. If we do hold this level though, then I think we're going to be keeping that 112 
in the crosshairs for another retest. Uh, guys, you got any thoughts on uh, what's going on in any of these pairs, dollar, yen, whatever at the moment? Well, I think Michael Brown knows what I would say next. <laughs> he, he knows my my GTC step, my GTC view on a uh, on cable is a uh, by the pound. Oh, always, always. always. Oh, you, uh, wow! Are you one of those permables? Well, I'm just, I'm just patriotic, mate. You know me. Rare breed, mate. A rare breed. Usually, everyone's <laughs> stinky, Sterling. <laughs> this is it. This is it. Look, yeah, yeah. It's definitely not a crowded trade. I'll give you a blue. <laughs> <laughs> no, most definitely not. Most definitely not. Um, though I am on the, a bit of a pound bag because I've had a little nibble in in euro sterling yesterday, just down into these lows here, just because it looked like a bit of a fixed move um, that we got yesterday afternoon. Uh, so I'm trying a bit of a counter trade on here. So, sorry, mate. Uh, I am short uh, the quid on this one. But uh, boo, I'm boo, take his passport no. off him. <laughs> <laughs> regulars, regulars here will know I like to play this this uh, pair both sides of the coin. So uh, I'm just trading the levels on this one. Um, right, let's have a quick look at some of the others. Um, Aussie dollar again. All these dollar pairs are looking looking the sim similar. We're having struggles up here we found some highs 69.50 was my sort of area we might run into a bit of trouble uh, ahead of looking at that uh, big 70 level above there um, we're holding the 69s that's going to be important but it's more psychologically important than anything else this zone here will be the decider I think below 68.70 and we know that's been a former resistance point then I think uh, again we may see a bit of a flush out and I'll probably have moved down to the low 68s once again. Uh, I need to look at some of the metals because I know our crowd here love looking at the likes of gold. Um, now this one, as you know, it's for me, it's all about just where the levels are going to show up. Um, so we've had this move down. It didn't stop at some of these lines. Um, it looks like it might be stopping. I said maybe 2030, this area was where it may find a bit of support it looks like it's trying to so we've got a bit more of a confirmation level here now into this 20s level um lo and behold we get up to one of the broken points and we're finding resistance there so i'm uh, see i don't know whether i'm going to take this 40 out yet because we are seeing a little bit of action around it but if i had to make a call i'd say potentially we're setting up a range 26 23 up towards that 70 area again um, and let's see what it does in the middle but that looks for now like an important confirmation of where the support areas are going to come in um be looking at copper as well a uh, bit of air coming out of this one um i still don't do you guys know what that spike was yesterday was it anything you saw related because i couldn't find anything it, it seemed to happen on the open oh just uh, just blame flows or profit taking or yeah china I, I stimulus think, or something like i that. think it i think i did obviously everyone's got a view on what causes what moves right but i did see some kind of logic that was kind of quite that made a lot of sense which is you know over the weekend we had a bit more kind of pro um housing news out of china and the case of there's just a lot of fomo in there again ahead of this week um this week-long holiday so you know the fact that we it was a you know classic blow off top right gap open then collapse so i think if you were yeah. going to try and blame anything i'd say it was just like a final ditch of people just trying to fill their boots and a load of fomo i don't think there's anything structural to it good cool mate good enough for me a bit more of a hopium trade um yeah anyway exactly that We've taken a knock back down under this uh, fib level, which was a level on the way up. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, bit of support as well. Um, so no surprise that we've had a break now and it's trying to hold underneath it. So this is going to be your marker moving forward uh, and seeing if it wants to go further or if the hopium trade continues much higher. Uh, Mark, I know you like looking at oil. Um, we found a bit of support now down into this uh, zone. I think you had this level highlighted as well down here. There's the 66s. Found a bit of a bounce there, mate. What's your thoughts going forward? I don't think my thoughts have changed particularly much, to be completely honest with you, mate. Um, the market seems to be rightly, I would argue, ignoring developments in the Middle East. And I think focus remains on whether there is a sustained 
pick up in uh, on the demand side, which seems to remain elusive at the moment. Well, you say there well, is more. I think, yeah, the price isn't screaming high like a lot of you know tourists will kind of challenge and say it should have done, which we all know would be a big fade. But um, I just post, just sent to you two um, because I still can't work out how to post to the main group. Um, a uh, chart from our all of our mutual friends, Arno at Capital Edge, um, which is the volatility. Um, and it's def it's moved into the expensive territory, which, yeah, I think may maybe keep one eye on that rather than just purely on the price. Um, so I think, yeah, again, as we've mentioned, well, everyone mentions many times in the past, um, I certainly have, that Israel going to war in Lebanon and Palestine and even Iran kind of throwing stuff over to them shouldn't really be seen as having a massive impact on crude prices as kind of counterintuitive as that is um just believe me on this one unfortunately as michael will tell you um my history um i've got a decent history in oil um so i can promise you when i tell you that around throwing stuff at israel unless it all kicks off in iran which at the moment we're not seeing um you really shouldn't see a bid in crude um no matter what people on social media tell you we certainly aren't going to be gapping open on a hundred dollars which some people normally always see someone telling you that after we see a bomb explode in Tehran. Um, that's not how it works. Um, in fact, you're probably the most profitable oil trade at the moment or in recent years is fading gaps open on a Monday morning, gaps higher on a Monday morning. Um, so yeah, whereas I, you know, Michael's right, we're not seeing crude spike higher on any of this and we really shouldn't. I think the fact that we are seeing Volgo bid, it's showing that people are, you know, there are some decent players out there taking some protection for upside, which is worth noting. That yeah, very well, very well said, mate. I know you got a lot of experience in in oil markets, and well, don't get me wrong, I still did me beans in it, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but you're, you're right, you know, we've every time we've had sort of a geopolitical risk rally, it gets knocked out soon after. We're still playing the game where the fundamentals uh, outweigh the the risk events at exactly the moment. That. I think it was so, the last, um, if I remember correctly, it was either the last one or one before. Um, yeah, this was just coming after the news that Saudi, you know, looking to carry on. Yeah, well, not looking to cut production, should I say? Um, and then they also lowered their uh, their price to uh, their benchmark pricing to the Middle East. Sorry, to, uh, sorry to the Far East. So it gives you an idea of where the Saudis think this is going, which is you know they're not exactly bullish on um, on buying or on buyers from uh, from the Far East, which is obviously a bad sign for crude prices. And it does feel like you know the, the chart you've got here is perfect example of how you know, going back to you know uh, start two thousand and three. Um, you know, you've got to hope that these levels sort of hold. Um, I, from the rumours that kind of, well, the, the language we're seeing, I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing um, it testing lower, especially if we start seeing some more productive news or constructive news, sorry, coming out of the Middle East, um, which, you know, I think everyone would like to see. Yeah, no, I, I think I, I can agree with that. <clears throat> this, this has been one asset that hasn't really got on the, uh, the hopium bus with the China yes, stimulus. So right. <clears throat> we're, we, we're potentially still going to see some softer data before we even see, you know, any effects of these rate cuts. So if, if that data does soften, it's going to kick a few uh, hopiums in the butt. And yeah, we could be seeing a, a bit of a move uh, low in these commodities as well. Uh, yields, going to have a quick butchers at those. Um, sorry, was that you, Michael? Did you? Sorry, that was me. I just said no, that. No, it wasn't me. I agree with you. you. No problem. Um, yeah, yields, this was one of the reasons why I was trying the dollar yen longs, just because we'd seen this move up of off, uh, off that low around about 350s. Um, I actually talked about this again on on this week's trade-off, uh, which uh, another plug there, jump on the link there, because I think there is some scope to see this going back up maybe towards 370s, 380s. I think 390s, 4s is a bit of a push, but you know we get some decent jobs data this week. I wouldn't be surprised if we're trading maybe up 370s, 375s, and the dollar will follow. But just remember the end game. The end game for the Fed is still to get rates down, irrespective of whether it gets good data, uh, unless that data is super duper hot. So I think uh, any rallies in yields up in these areas, 390s, 380s, will probably be a bit enticing uh, for bond buyers to come in and, and start picking it up again. But uh, in the meantime, Pairs like dollar yen are going to follow. Um, tens, uh, they seem to be struggling up at the 380 mark. 
Um, so keep an eye on that. If we do see that coming down a bit more, getting back under 370, the reverse will happen and the dollar will be following that. And it's probably what dollar yen's following right now this morning because um, we're trading back down 143.70s. So still got that uh, differential, mate, as you call it, the old bear steepener, Michael, the difference between uh, what's happening at the short end and versus the long end. Uh, yes, we have. Although the curve has actually flattened quite a fair chunk over the last couple of days, the two tens has tightened up to about 12 basis points from the 22-ish wides that we saw last week. Um, I think that's probably a function of uh, perhaps the continued reaction to Powell's remarks yesterday, um, just throwing a bit of cold water on the, the bets towards a 50 basis point cut. But then again, as we were saying earlier, you know, we're dealing with a, a data dependent Fed and obviously we've got the jobs report due on Friday lunchtime. So if you end up with a soft payroll sprint and unemployment ticking higher, then you know we're going to be back in this game of 50 basis points becomes the base case and the curve is, is steepening once more. So a fair bit of chop going on at the moment. Um, and I would expect that to continue really until we get to the, the meat of things a bit later in the week. Yep. Thank you very much, mate. And uh, I think we'll, we'll call that a day. I've kept you guys uh, from your businesses long enough. I know Ryan probably hasn't abused anyone on Twitter for 45 minutes. So <laughs> no time. <laughs> it's to get back to that. And Michael's probably got uh, a cheese sandwich to get through. Or I, I haven't made any puns for 45 minutes. I'm starting to get nervous over here. But you get you get it like you get the Joe you're Jones in for a pun, aren't you? So I get itchy skin. <laughs> <laughs> but but well, I'm right, can I just can I just say thank you so much for inviting me on? I really really enjoyed it. Hopefully I didn't embarrass myself too much. No, of course not, mate. Of course not. I look, I, I didn't even have need to uh I, was, I had this ready for you. <laughs> oh no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh well played. Well played, indeed. Uh, I didn't need it. I didn't need it. So uh, I, I will. I will keep it for next time, though. Yeah, know. please do. Please. Do. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure to have you on, mate. And uh, thank you, mate. Your viewers, please check out uh, Ryan's stuff over yes, at Peak Suite. Uh, give it a look. It, it could help with your trading. And uh, thank you, as always, Mr. Michael Brown from Pepperstone. Um, thank you, mate. Always pleasure. On the socials with his. Uh, Really bad puns. Oh, terrible. <laughs> awful, 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 awful puns. Awful. <laughs> if you get banned from Twitter just from that, I'm oh right, I'm, I'm, I've tried reporting him, but no one's biting a. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, right. yeah, thank you very much, gents. Uh, I will speak to you no doubt shortly, and thank you to all our viewers for coming to the Flow Show. Hope you've had a good session today, and we'll see you uh, as always, bright and breezy tomorrow morning. Have a good day ahead, everyone. Brilliant. Cheers, good guys. Night. Thank you all. Bye. Hey traders, this is Blake Morrow with Forex Analytics. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like these videos, share them, and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of the content that we provide here for free. Thanks for stopping by. I'll see you in the next video.